Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining me today in the Beehive Women in VoiceOver. I'm foregoing my opening music and my closing music because the podcast today is a, quite a serious topic. On Thursday, February 8th of this year, 2018, an article at CNN.com was published titled, They're Not Celebrities, Their Voice Coach Isn't Either, But the Me Too Movement Changed Their Lives. This is a story of 16 women who came forward to say that a respected voiceover coach in New York City preyed upon them and their desire to be successful in the voiceover industry. And for years, each of them thought that she was the only one. As of today, Tuesday, March 6th, more than 50 women have come forward accusing voiceover coach Peter Rofay of various kinds of sexual misconduct and assault. I'm privileged to have two of these women on the show today. The details of their experiences with Peter Rofay are different, but their stories share the common threads of violation, betrayal of trust, and sexual misconduct on the part of Peter Rofay. Becky Poole and Heather Costa share their stories here on The Beehive. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So you both are voice actors in the Los Angeles area, and your careers are... Thriving as careers thrive. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know, right? There's always that. If, if you're when working in voiceover, exactly. you're thriving. <laughs> it's a, it's you know, it's up and down and up and yeah. down and the, the the roller coaster ride that we all experience. So why don't we start with you, Heather? Sure. And why don't you just tell us about your career and how you got into voiceover? Okay, I moved to California about a year ago, um, and I started voiceover in 2004. And uh, just started small market stuff, just yeah. kind of building up uh, my career. And w and were you in New York City? I was about you... an hour north of the city. Okay. So I had a studio in my home, okay. and I'd go into the city to do stuff. In 2004, you had a studio in your home? I did. That's impressive. My <laughs> husband would hold a, a foam over my head. and <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's great. That's great. It's evolved a lot since. Sure. <laughs> Not so much. I don't know. There's a blanket hanging from my wall. So. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I can't believe I'm doing it that long. I think it really started taking off in about 2008, 2009. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a year ago. We decided it was time for – there were just more opportunities for the type of work specifically that I wanted here versus yeah. New York. And uh, my family and I made the leap and – here we are. That's fantastic. And so your husband was doing something that could move as well? Yes, he works in higher education. Okay, so. fantastic. Becky, tell us a little bit about your foray into voiceover. Sure. <laughs> I was in New York City, and I went to NYU, and then I lived there for about 10 years after that. Okay. I worked at Nickelodeon, and I went out for margaritas with like my roommate and his crew at uh -huh. Noggin and uh -huh. they were like oh my god we love your voice would you and I was like oh this is how it happens like you actually just oh, talk to people um, and so that was great and then I started doing like promos for Noggin and and then it just kind of snowballed from there I got it from Nickelodeon I got an agent and I but definitely it was like around that time too I was like oh I have to get a demo and I have to like put yeah. all this stuff that I did together yeah, and yeah. um so yeah and then I just I moved around um Let's see, I was in Seattle for a little bit, and I did some video game stuff out there in mocap. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was so fun. I love doing mocap. And <laughs> Are you that. doing any of that here? No, because I'm not, like, a stunt person, and I feel like so much of that, what I've – I, you know, I, I just haven't been – trying for it yeah, yeah, because yeah. I was like, well, oh, I was, I'm not. Well, I was going to say, like, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know – nobody I know who does – mocap and, and performance capture they're not stunt people they're oh. voice actors <laughs> oh that's great yeah Good. so I'll, feel I'll try free. harder yeah. <laughs> we did like one workshop and the guy was so buff and like he looked like the rock and i was like well all right not for me i, I <laughs> can play so chubby funny. kids uh yeah that's hilarious no. <laughs> do, you, do you know sissy jones i don't you don't know her i remember one of the first pictures i saw of her on twitter she was pregnant to hear <laughs> like eight months pregnant in a mocap Awesome. So she's like doing mocap as a pregnant person. So, yeah. so there you go. Well, I great. I I'm gonna I'm gonna try harder. Yeah. If yeah. any of you out there, no, I, <laughs> uh, I then I moved to Chicago and I got more like commercial work. Yeah, there. Big, big commercial. I center. kind of and but the video game stuff was just yeah. dead there. Yeah. So that was too bad. And then I was like, well, I want to be in LA anyway. I Chicago was kind of a stop where I was like, we're just gonna. Oh, 
and go to LA. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So then I'm here and I definitely am, you know, trying to do more of the animation stuff, kind of like when I was back in New York. Yeah. Um, it's a and, good spot. It's a good spot for animation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. So that and then just commercial stuff still. Just Fantastic. You know, slogging, trying. Yep. That's what we're all doing. <laughs> yep. Slogging, totally. trying. Mm-hmm. We're working our way, right? Yeah. Whew. Excellent. So what you guys have in common here is that you both studied at some point with this guy, Peter Rofe. Yes. I've yeah. never met the man. I've never met You're the lucky. man in my life. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and obviously that had a big impact on your careers. I mean, on your studying, I should say. I yes. mean, I, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So um, to the extent that you want to tell us what happened, you know, I, I invite you. You started studying with him when? Uh, I started in 2008. It was okay. actually at that point when I realized it was time to take that next step in uh-huh. my career. And um, everyone in New York, he was so highly recommended. And he was just, you know, that top level coach and had all these connections with agents and casting directors and a great way to meet people. And um, so, yeah, I started studying with him and he took advantage of that very thing. I imagine, I mean, just based on my own experiences, I know that perpetrators like this Mm -hmm. have a particular way of operating they they engender your trust yes exactly right? mm-hmm. so there and it's quite it can be quite a long process of, yeah. of engendering that trust and is so is that is that how that sort yes of happened? Uh, for me it was definitely more now looking back uh calculated drawn out it yes. was very um unfortunately there are some women in the group that we have found when we found each other that you know for some of them it was more immediate and then just he acted like it was you know oh well yeah this is what happens okay let's go on and coach you know and for others it was more of like he was working the you know um which is what it felt like for me yeah yeah like same stories same scripts to yes. have uh, women read same like really thought out yep so so what was so what was that process? I mean, what he was it was sort of like here we're going to read this, and it it was it, it's a piece of copy that requires a female voice to be sexy yep. to be like which yeah, is he even had which is so in. much of what we oh read, yeah right yeah that's so not uncommon right right and that's what he would feed into he would be pushing that um, kind of that sexy read that mm-hmm. you know you need to be uninhibited and you need to you know. Uh, I think depending upon, I don't know if it was depending upon the talent's background or depending upon what he was thinking in that moment, um, there were certain scripts that he, like, he was working on a script as an actor and he wanted help. Uh, um, I did not, that wasn't my, that wasn't my, <laughs> that, that wasn't the tra- tactic he used with me. <laughs> no, I, I, I had yeah, But it is script. interesting to see, like. I had a like, beer script that was, yeah. like, sexy and funny and, and he needed, you know, it, he just approaches it in a way that makes you, he feeds into the very thing that us as actors are like, okay, yeah, yeah, we got to get into this. Mm-hmm. And then it, it's, ugh. yeah. What I thought was most striking about reading the article and then hearing our voices and the, like the whole thing together. And, and this is the everybody. article that was, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that, mm-hmm. that, that's okay. I know that there was an article in CNN. Yeah. Yes. And, and what, what was the first what was the first article that came out? Was that in Variety or was that? No. I, CNN. That right. was CNN. CNN was, was it. the first okay. one. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was picked up, though. Yes. Right? By yes. a bunch of different places. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But yeah. The, the thing that really struck me about that wasn't, like, being overwhelmed by everyone's stories because I kind of already had heard those on the right. Facebook page. But the, um, the, the idea that being free for an actor and for a woman in particular is, like, be sexually free and like right. that that's what like there is no mm-hmm. other freedom except sexual to, except freedom. sexual yeah. freedom and that was that that's... was that made me extra sad reading all yeah. that yeah but, yeah mostly because it was like you do i do i want to be free i want to be sexually free i want to be but that is exactly when you're young you're ex- you're exploring those things you're trying to find your identity yes and that is exactly what a predator is going to go for They're exactly gonna, and right for me it mm-hmm. was like it was almost daring, and it was almost like, a, mm. like, oh, come on, don't worry about it. My fiance 
I have a fiance, it's fine. And I would be like, oh, well, meet me halfway. He asked me to take my clothes off for the read because um, it would be more. Yeah. I could get sexier if I right. was. And you I was like, right. well, or, I just yeah. went to theater school. And, like, uh, we're we're always, we're always exploring with that sort of thing and, uh, you know, yeah. how, to be a, how to be a better actor. And well, I guess this is just part of that same deal. All right. I'm uncomfortable. But it's my teacher. And then all the ways that you try to, like, take back control of the situation mm-hmm. of, like, oh, I can do that. I'm cool. All right. Well, you're going to meet me halfway. Like, I'll, right. I'll take off my shirt if you take off your shirt. Like, oh, like he was, <laughs> oh, I never thought of that. You know what I mean? But, like, in your yeah. mind, you're like, I'm taking control. Right. Yes. But you're not. But, right. Yeah. Yes. You're doing what you can in the moment. Right. Yeah, to to exactly. To, uh, to kind of survive it. Yep. And, and And to, to make it um, fit into reality. Yeah. You know, um, wow. Yeah. I know that there's all kinds of commentary, you know, on the on the Me Too movement. There are obviously just an untold number of women who uh, identified, right? And who could say, oh, yeah, in, in their own way. Yeah, that kind of stuff happened to me. Yeah. I mean, in every... Um, in every area, not just acting, you know, mm-hmm. um, but e- every area of work. And it, it's uh, just this, it's, I, I just was, I was overwhelmed by it. I was overwhelmed with just how massive the movement, if you, I don't know what else to call it, mm-hmm. except it's like an awakening, you mm-hmm. know, a kind of a wow. And I know for me, the, the, the uncovering of my own participation in the, oh, men are just men, boys are boys, oh, it's, it's excusable, you know, all of that stuff where, wow, wait, stop, what? And and then there was, often there was criticism yes. of people who come forward saying, why didn't you stop it? You should have known better. Mm-hmm. Oh, who, what kind of a woman would take off their, like, don't you have a, a you mm-hmm. know, a, a brain in your head? Like, and you go, wait, 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 wait. The the reality of being in the arts and actors, film, stage, television, voiceover, it's our job to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. It's our job to do things in front of a camera, in front of a microphone that people do privately mm-hmm. because we're sharing, mm-hmm. we're, we're illuminating the human experience. And so it seems to me that it, it's a... It's really easy to take advantage of people who are seeking in their creative lives to tell the truth, to, to, mm-hmm. to speak the truth about the human experience, right? Mm-hmm. And that that's what makes this so insidious and so yes. awful is that a, a guy like this knows that. He knows that, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And um, you don't know what it's like until you're in that circumstance when it's a part of your craft mm-hmm. to to learn how to be vulnerable, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to make judgments about people, you know, you you want to do what you can and what you have to to get to the truth, right? And so, mm-hmm. but therein lies just the perfect opportunity for a perpetrator to to take advantage. Right. So. What was it like for you to recall all of this? Me Too was a very, it it was, uh, everything changed at that moment because all of a sudden I realized this thing that I had been carrying with me, first of all, now was the chance So uh, to say something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it happened to me in uh, 2008 and 2009. It was, as I said, a very calculated, very slow process with, in my situation. And, uh, it wasn't until a few years after that that I had realized why I had pulled back. I pulled back from, after it happened, I pulled back from going to, I didn't go to conferences. I didn't go to workshops. I didn't, you know, I was terrified to go to auditions that I was going to run into him. Mm. And, um, but it was weird because as you were saying, you know, keeping, keeping in control and convincing yourself that you didn't do something wrong after I worked with him, I did go to his, uh, he had a workshop, but he wasn't teaching it. It was mm. by an agent, you know, and, and, and it was a great experience and I, I didn't see him there. He wasn't there. But then all of a sudden the email stopped and I was, you know, again, I'm thinking, well, maybe I did do something wrong. I started, I started thinking like, cause I never, ever, ever, ever thought that he could have done this to anybody else. Cause in yeah. that moment you're thinking, 
well, everything he did, I didn't, I didn't reciprocate. I was in control. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm pushing away. I'm moving away. I'm, t- I'm, I'm like turning away. I'm trying. So I didn't feel like I invited that. Yeah. But I started to doubt myself thinking, well, maybe I did do something that told him that was okay. And I was paranoid that he had badmouthed me mm-hmm. to the yeah. industry, yeah. That, that I had done something wrong that I didn't realize and that maybe that's how I was perceived. And it just, it, it killed me in that way. So I, I called him out on not sending me invitations anymore to these events. And he gave me some story about my just something that I didn't make his other students feel comfortable because of other connections I had wow. in the industry. It was ridiculous. Whoa. And then I and then I remember saying something like, I don't know what you're talking about. I think this is really, um, oh, and he, he, I forgot about this, something so simple. It was like he unsubscribed from my newsletter. And I sent him an email. I was like, seriously? And he, and there was a little bit of banter. I was like, well, I, you know, I think this was really ridiculous of you. And I don't understand why you're acting this way. And, and then that was it. We didn't talk after that. And it was just, I felt again that I had, had done, done something, something wrong. wrong. Yeah. Placed you know, it squarely in exactly. your court. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I really screwed up. He doesn't want me around his other students. He doesn't, not thinking it was because he couldn't go any further. Like it didn't, it didn't, you know, it was like, okay, I'm done studying privately because, you know, it went on for a while. And uh, then I buried that really deep. And uh, it was maybe a couple years after that, a couple years after that, that another woman who now is in our group, uh, she contacted me and, and she's like, oh, I saw you study with Peter O'Fay. And I was like, it, it was the first time I heard that name in yeah, a while. And I was yeah. like, uh, yeah. And the questions she was asking, in that, I still remember taking that phone call. And in that moment, all of a sudden, something went off and I was like, why is she asking these questions like this? Yeah. Wait a minute. Does she know something? And like, I couldn't even come out and say, I was like, why are you asking? Like, I was waiting for her to say something. And she told me, and I was just like, I think I stopped breathing. Like, I was just so yeah. in shock. Yeah. And, uh, and she told me there was one other woman too. And so I knew there were three of us. And we were talking for a while, you know, on and off over, over time. And like, okay, we're going to do something. Like, if there's three of us, there's got to be more. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd get up the courage and we would start, like, kind of warning people or telling people. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And so we started contacting lawyers. Wow. And we were like, okay, we had, something's wrong. Like, we think there's more people. Like, what do we do? And like, 2000. 2000- this was, or something? Uh, so um, I want to say maybe 12, okay. 13, okay, yeah. some, maybe somewhere so, there. So a while ago. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Um, and uh, 34, I can't, I, oh, I can't remember exactly. It's okay. I just, it, but, but it's not connected to the Me Too. No, 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 no. It's, and, uh, it was prior to that. And we were getting shot down. Like we even called, um, you know, some really prominent female lawyers and they're just like, oh, you're out of the statute of limitations. There's not enough of you. And we're like, okay, well, what can we do? And they're like, well, you know, you can kind of see if there's other women. We're, we're like, well, can he come after us? Like, I'm, I'm scared to yeah, do this, yeah. to like publicly say something. Yeah. And they're like, well, just be careful. Like, just, you know, make it more of like a conversational kind of, hey, I have something to tell you and see if it kind of spreads. And so I'd be like, okay, all right, you know, we can do this. And um, then you'd bury it back down because that was pretty deflating, I must say. Sure, yeah. And uh and then something, something would trigger. Somebody would say his name or somebody, you know, I was at a workshop and, and there was a gentleman there who obviously didn't know and he's praising him. And I'm sitting in front of him and I'm just like, my stomach is turning and I'm like, oh my gosh. And that weekend, I like told five more people because it like mm. brought it all back up, including some, um, you know, important people in my life that I knew could help me really get the strength behind it to tell more. So then I would, and then I would bury it back down. And this went on for a while. Yeah. And then I remember I was away. I was out of town when the Me Too thing happened. And it was late at night. And I get back to my hotel. And I was by myself. My husband wasn't there. And I started scrolling on my phone before I go to sleep. And I see all this stuff. And I was like, Me Too? What is that? Like, what's going on? And so I look it up. And I was like, whoa, whoa. This is like something's happening. And all of a sudden, I couldn't sleep that night. And I just start, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do something. I can, now is the time. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do this. 
And I wake up that next morning and, and I'm driving home. I think I was, in, I was in San Diego and I'm driving home and I'm calling people that I hadn't told before, really good friends that I just had never yeah. told. Yeah. And um, I spend all day, you know, trying to, to deal with this and getting up the courage. And I hang up the phone with a girlfriend. And as I'm hanging up the phone with her, I look on the computer and I see that someone had posted about their experience with Peter Rofay. And I just lost it. I was wow. like, I was like, oh my gosh, his name is out there. Is somebody else? I don't know who this person is. Who is this that worked with him? That now there's this. It's just I started like spinning. I was just wow. you know. Um, so the woman who posted it had shared it with permission from one of the other women in our group. Okay. So I didn't know that person. And she had shared it from, I think it was in a mom's group, and she shared it with her permission in a voiceover group, and okay. that's where yes. I saw it. All right, yeah. yeah. So then I contacted the woman that this happened to, and uh, and she's like, oh, my gosh, I've already talked to five other women, and I can't believe this. And I think by that night, there were maybe six or eight of us. I mean, it was just growing and growing, and then that whole week was just completely consumed by this. I couldn't function. I was apologizing to my family and I was just completely consumed by it yeah. because it brought up so much and realizing with every day more and more women and the stories and how similar they were. And sadly, a lot of these women never pursued voiceover. Yeah. They never, they just stopped. They didn't continue. I think I, I was feeling worse and better depending on the moment because I felt like you know, that guilt of, I should have pushed more. But then I was like, I can't do that to myself because I couldn't. I did the best that I could do, you know. And then it started changing for me because then I started talking to all these women that in that moment they were finding out right then that they were not alone. Right. That they hadn't even told their husbands for years. And I was remembering like what they were going through was what I had gone through back when I all found out there ago, was at yeah. least two other women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's how it started with me too. <laughs> and so I saw this post, mm -hmm. you know, in this in this voiceover group and uh and I spoke to to someone who was not a victim of his, mm -hmm. but who um, who was super aware, friends, you know, mm -hmm. and who she too was sort of, you know, spreading the word, mm -hmm. right? And so as a result of that, you collected up this group of, of women, yes. right? And, and it grew to how many before you got press coverage <laughs> about this? Yeah. I don't it's really interesting because I get so particular about my story when mm -hmm. when like any little thing that is not right about mine, I'll be like, Well well that's not exactly <laughs> that's how it happened for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. In another situation I wouldn't be so worried about like, well, when did what happen? But like because it is like I finally get to yes. tell it out loud, I wanna yeah. be so specific. Yes, it was like the the Me Too I think what's so important about that was that it was cultural mm, and so it was yes. and it helped us get together and it wasn't like a particular it, it hmm, what am I trying to say so I'll just tell you what happened to yeah, me please. with that I had always kind of ha held this story as like my funny uncle story which I think is like everyone knows oh that guy's a creep but nobody does anything right mm -hmm. and so, like that's kind of the problem let right? me let me mm -hmm. let me back you up a little bit so you were in new york and how did you begin studying with him honestly don't remember i don't remember the how like the timeline mm -hmm. i just remember that i studied with him in his to work on a demo and i studied in his apartment so, Which is super common, everybody. Exactly. Right? We, we have yep. studios in our houses. I had, to, I had a studio in my bedroom. I once had a yeah. client come over and I was like, oh, this has to change. Like, I can't <laughs> yeah. have this, you know, guy in my closet. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I was like, ah. So it's super <laughs> totally. common. Teach right? a musical saw. I have people yeah. come over and I'm like, oh, that might be dumb. Like, yeah. I don't maybe want you in my house. Alone yeah, with yeah. So <laughs> I mean, just to give that sort of context, yeah. happens right? happens all the time. That's the first line of my yeah. of my Facebook Me Too story. Yeah. It was like, I was in his apartment. That's normal. Like, yeah, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh, where was I? So, I'm so sorry. No, no, that's great. So You're working on a demo. Working on him. a demo. Yeah. And then, so that started in the apartment with private lessons and that, it was creepy the whole time, but I didn't stop. I I had my eyes on the prize. I want that demo, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I'm here. My 
parents were probably paying for it at that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I didn't, I was going to, this was going to get done. And I knew that for me, that was, that was the important part. Right. And I'll shove everything else away. Um. So yeah, so it was always, and I wasn't really, again, I don't remember the timeline after it happened. I told some friends that I had been in a play with and like a good friend of mine now who's also in voiceover, Noelle Romano, she's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I told her and because she was, we were close. And then I told, I might have even said something on, I did stand up at the time. I probably like had a joke about it. And I told one other person who I knew had gone to him for a lesson. And she was mm. like, oh, yeah, he he did something weird to me. And I just stopped going to him. And so oh, then I was no. like, oh, oh, my God, I'm the dumb one. No. I'm the one who let him do it. You know, like that's oh, how I yeah. felt, right? I yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, yeah. and then, you know, he'd get over it. And I got over it forever. But there's that yes. someone's a creep. Someone's a creep. And nobody says anything like, oh, that's just my funny story about that thing that happened to me. Yeah, right. Um, rather than like really deal with it and go, no, nah, no, nah, funny uncle shouldn't be a thing. Like, right, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Me Too um, day, I was like, this is it. So I wrote it. And then within two minutes, mm. people were responding to me on my messages. Like three or four people were like, uh, was this Peter Rofe? Because oh I didn't gosh. say his name because I already, I was like, I'm not going to. I don't right. I don't know legally if I can do that. Right, right. So um, and then it connected me with. Can I say Elizabeth's name? Yes, she was in the article. <laughs> okay, oh, great. All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. No. Um, so, yeah, so they connected me with Elizabeth, saying that she was someone else who was looking for people, and someone connected me with you. I like. I think a, a male voice of a friend of ours um, connected and said that you were also looking for people. And so it was this thing of, like, it wasn't just, like, one person yes. having the, like, the ovaries to do it. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like it was that. everybody kind of taking. Huevos, right? <laughs> yeah, right. the huevos. Absolutely, <laughs> we have those. That's what I can say. Because yeah. then I don't have to go too blue. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, and it was it was the movement of it yeah. was yeah. is really important. I think to like keep available. It's everybody's strength at the same time. And then you have yeah. people who really can like grab on and like it, like you and Elizabeth were just real great about um, keeping up with the Facebook stuff because I noticed. After that first couple of days, mm-hmm. I was like, I'm a face person. Like, I want mm. to meet everybody. And I noticed that people were a little bit like, uh, uh, uh-uh. And I was like, oh, because this was some people's first time yes. dealing with it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a scary thing. Yeah. It's a scary thing. And so, like, say. yeah, I kind of backed off a little bit. <laughs> and that's because people need that. They need to right. be able to. Yeah. 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 It was nice to have other people to come together with but it definitely opens it up again yes yeah. yes right. the emotions yeah. that it yeah. brought up which is not bad that's good right it's, a good thing. <laughs> right. it's just it's just unexpected right it's yes. sort of like yeah. what what yeah you know, i'm coming back to this thing after so long and, mm-hmm. and, and i already pushed aside i already pushed away all these yeah. or dealt even dealt with because mm-hmm. i would say that it's a process all the way right it's not like it's not that it's never going to be shocking to me that that happened or never going to be affect me Right. But like, but I definitely dealt with it before and then here it is again. No, it's a thing of not being able to undo it. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't Mm -hmm. undo it. And we can look back on our younger selves and, and, and sort of say, I mean, I know, you know, I I, I mentioned to, um, to my guests here that, um, the experience I had when I was 19 and, um, which I talked about in the podcast on the favorite failures. Um, so I, I won't go into too too much too much detail about it. But it's just that thing of looking back on your younger self and realizing that I was different then. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I was not equipped for that kind of treatment because I I wasn't expecting it. I, right. I wasn't. Right. You know, I lived in a fairly sheltered protected world and I was a starry-eyed little dreamer about my music career and here I was you know about to embark on it with such lovely naivete not not bad but like mm-hmm. oh my it's my dream and it's coming true mm-hmm. you know and then somebody like squishes it yeah. you know by virtue of their selfishness their you know narcissism all of that stuff yeah. yeah as if they're entitled to us you yeah. know right and um, that, right and that's not, that's not our young selves fault right 
that exactly. Right. right. Exactly. And yet we look back and go, oh, somehow, I why all these years different. I should have done something different. Yeah. I should have behaved differently. But, you know, I say that now as an almost 56-year-old woman. And you go, well, you, yeah, you know better now. The Me Too thing as a tool at that time, I just remember thinking, like, why didn't I? I'm, I've always been an opinionated, loudmouth person. Like, <laughs> why didn't I come forward? And it's like, oh, I... I didn't think the tools existed or I didn't know where they existed. Mm -hmm. I did not know to go to anyone except friends and talk about it. I didn't know to go. There there was no internet. Uh, it was the 1800s. <laughs> no, like, there wasn't Facebook. Right, there wasn't, right, yeah. like, you just talked to other women about it. And yeah. it was all hush. Like, yeah. yeah. And now, now yeah, it it's, it's hush. It's hush as if we ought to be ashamed. Right. Like, yeah. oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I think a piece of this, you know, what this this podcast that I do, right, is it's about women in voiceover and it and we talk about um our experiences, we talk about our particular strengths, right? And I think that we have such strengths, you know, relationally, right? And with our willingness to be emotionally vulnerable, you know, we we those things are great assets. You know, they they mm -hmm. really are. They're diff it's different than men. And that's fine. That's like sort of how we were designed, I, I think, you mm -hmm. know, with, with different gifts that are complementary, right? And yet, I should say, you know, here we are, you know, when someone takes advantage of the gifts that we, that we possess, right, um, to use to their own, you know, own benefit, mm -hmm. their own, well, I don't even know what you call that, you know, but, oh, right. um, <laughs> um I, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say uh, to, to their own pleasure. I mean, I, I have no yeah. idea. Like, I guess, I guess that's what it is. It's ego feeding. I, I don't, power I don't, trip. I don't, it's power for mm -hmm. sure. It's power. And like, it doesn't even mm. matter what it is because it's not, I mean, it matters. It matters why people do things, but like to be held accountable for your actions, it doesn't matter what you were doing it for. Correct. I, uh, totally. Yeah. Right? Is yeah. that right? Oh my yes. gosh. Am I going to regret those words someday? No, Maybe. no, no, no. <laughs> it doesn't. It, it, no, it doesn't. And even including, no, I'm not even going to say that. No, I will, because I think this is coming up a lot, is the like, even as our young selves who didn't have the tools or didn't mm -hmm. have, like, I can look back now and you learn, like, oh, maybe I would not do that now. And like, I can even look back and be held accountable for my no, no, can't can't say it. I was like, going to say held accountable for my action of like being there and allowing no. that to happen, but that is no. That's no. Well, I this oh, is I know so interesting. Go ahead. Oh, where it's like, no matter what I chose to do in that moment, I was not the one who was in charge of what was happening. Right, right, and like right. that is the that's the difference. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a great distinction because I do think like I look back at my 19 year old self and I go, why did you stay the night? You made that choice. You made that choice to stay the night. I can say, yes, I'm responsible for making that choice. I did make it and I made it to protect myself. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so. So, yeah, I am yeah. responsible for it. And in that regard, I I take away I I I, I sort of. If I say I'm not responsible, then I, I, I take on the victim mantle and I right. carry it. I kind of right. carry it forever. Yeah. Right. As, as opposed to, no, I was in I was in a circumstance where I was threatened. Mm -hmm. I was right. threatened. And so I I made a choice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. To, to, and this is why. And this is what my yeah. choice yes. was. This is why. And I'm responsible for that choice. Totally. I can totally mm -hmm. accept that. Am I right. responsible for the situation that I was placed in? No. 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 Right. But there is some there is a piece of uh, power, I think, that you you take back a control of your own life that you take back by saying, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, I stayed. And mm -hmm. here's why I stayed. Exactly. And I made the choice. Yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, we're arguing why we stayed. Right. right. And it's yeah. like, I don't need to argue that point. That I Correct. Need, this person Correct. needs to tell me why they did what they, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Well, you said it way better than I did. I just wanted to get, <laughs> get a warning. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I just it's it's so. I'm like really verbose, right? I before you guys got here, I was trying to put together, a, you know, an opening thing, and I I was tongue tied, mm -hmm. just tongue tied. How do you talk about this? How do you, how do you begin? How do you articulate? It's such a swirl of conflicting emotion and uh, anger and fear and um, 
remorse and, Mm -hmm. you know, looking back and just like wishing things could be different, but they're not. And I mean, it's really, it's really hard. And it's, it's, and, and we haven't even touched on the, the kind of the cultural aspect of, of what, of why we respond the way we do, you know, as women, why we respond the way we do and how much it's just ingrained in everything we watch and see. And, Mm -hmm. and it's funny because there's, there's a piece of it that is the whole notion of, well, boys will be boys, right? Mm -hmm. There's a piece of that. That's true. You, you watch any three-year-old boy Mm -hmm. and a three-year-old girl, they behave very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I never wanted to believe it, but the older I get, the more I'm (laughs) like, yep, I see (laughs) that. But that doesn't mean that we don't, we're not responsible to guide them yeah, and t- into into behavior that is uh, socially correct, mm-hmm. right? We're not not, not full just beings yeah. who can express both of uh, both or all a sure. spectrum of uh, uh, yes. right. Just the idea that you know, w- as parents, you know, we are responsible for molding and shaping our children and, mm-hmm. and to becoming responsible, good and decent adults. I think too often times we let go of that with regard to men's sexual behavior. We excuse mm-hmm. a lot of it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And this is such a tangent. I was thinking about this because we were, my husband and I were checking out new places to live, right? Because this, our, the rent's too high here, and blah blah blah. It's another, <laughs> so that's another podcast. Um, so, so we're looking around, and you know, you see two bedroom, three bedroom. You see bachelor's apartment bachelor's apartment mm. do you know the word the corresponding female word to bachelor spinster i was gonna say oh. is it spinster spinster wow. and and I, I was thinking about it i was like wow the connotations wow, wow. bachelor is fun bachelor, that's, that's gonna cool. be a fun house I, i'm a woman i want a bachelor apartment exactly you know like yeah. spinster oh wow. dried up shriveled no life mm. So stuck in the place, yeah, not stuck like a in place, it. not a pad. It's not, not a bedroom not a pad. pad. It's just a, a place out. with no windows and darkness, uh-huh. right? And like, just even that time, those words, yeah. those words have they're so there. It's crazy, yeah. and and then you you realize that that is everywhere, which says men okay for you to be sexual. I mean, I don't have no idea why I even said that, except except the you know the cultural norms right that and that the things that we ourselves even though we have been subjected to terrible terrible demeaning behavior on the part of men and yet we say boys will be boys yeah Mm. and and we we excuse it in a way that i think and i think that was the i think that was the magnitude of me too it's sort of like Mm. okay yeah i don't think we can excuse that anymore yeah and uh um i remember my husband just saying to me like When I, and I told him about what happened to me when I was 19 for the first time last Mm. fall. Oh, wow. And he was like, what? You know, Mm. like, uh, you know, it was just incredulous that anyone would treat another. Like, Mm -hmm. it it would never, that kind of stuff just just doesn't cross his mind, right? So, um, wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that is definitely surprising when you, when you do tell like a man that you care about. And it's like, oh, I think even with the, um, like catcalling and, and all that too. It was like, have you really never noticed that? <laughs> like, it's so yeah. I, like, and I don't, I honestly don't blame people if they're willing to look at it. I don't blame men for being surprised or shocked. It should be surprising, shocking. It's awful stuff. Yeah. But like, I, that, that was surprising that, that men were like, whoa, this happens to you so often or like that happened to you. It's like, oh, yeah. Hmm. Are you, are you did listening? you guys see, <laughs> did you see that um, illustration? I can't remember where it was exactly, but this story about uh, a a teacher in some environment of men and women who said, men, ask ask the men in the room, so when you uh, leave the house or if you're going out, what what precautions do you take for, like, Hmm. safety, you know, from going from your house to where, and the men were like, what? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then she was like, "Okay, women," and they, and they were like, "Well, I carry my keys in my hand at all times. I never rent a, an apartment on the lower floor. It's always on the second Oof. floor. Um, I park my car underneath a light. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know." And the men were like, "Wow, they, mm. you know, they were stunned that we go through all of this. I, if I take my dog for a walk, I take my 
pepper spray, mm. you know, mm-hmm. like, and th- these are all the things that women were saying that they do yeah. just to walk out the door and feel safe, somewhat safe. Yeah. Right? And I, don't, I feel like I even still have to, like, I'd have to note that right now because I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure. Like, I don't hold my keys in my hand anymore. But like, I bet I park under a light and I don't even notice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> again, it was like watching that thing. I too had that sort of thing like, oh my, I do those things. Yeah. I do Without them. I don't even think about, about it. Right. Exactly. And I don't think that men are out there not doing it. I think everybody's doing exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody parks under a light. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how was it that you ended up with your story being told by CNN? Well, we so as our group continued to grow, uh, we were all, you know, we were there for each other for support and just for listening and to also figure out, well, what can we do? Like, what can we, obviously, if there's this many, there's even more. And there yeah. were... There were over 30 of us when the article came out and 13, we've spoken to 13 more women Mm -hmm. since then. So we're at about 45, 45 women, 45 women that we've talked to. Are any of those women inside the statute of limitations? Um, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I have not heard that yet. Yeah. I don't, I think the statute of limitations is one year, by the way, just, yeah. Sorry. It depends on year. Um, one year. Let that sink in. Yeah. If uh, it, if he had raped somebody, which, you know, who knows, mm-hmm. um, then there's no statute on that. Um, oh, well, that's good to know. Yes. I thought it was And still it depends two. on the state. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. In, in New York, it's New one York. year. It's one year. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so a big part of why we all came forward is because, you know, up until now, and I'm not sure exactly what's happening in this moment for him, but up until now, he had a very thriving, successful business. So here we were finding more women every day, and he's holding classes and having private coaching sessions. And it was just destroying us to know that there are women, and still there were women that have not heard. They just don't, they haven't heard. Right. And so... For us to now, when we realize the magnitude of what it is, and we we are all dealing with our own personal issues with it, you know, this can't continue. This can't. He has to be stopped. He has to be stopped. (laughs) Right. No matter what the statute of limitations is, you don't want to be with this person alone. Exactly. He should not be teaching. No. And, um, you know, through all of that, we were realizing, okay, well, what can we do? And we went to the police. And um, it was actually thanks to SAG who sent out an email saying, if you have experienced anything like this, contact this detective. And we did. And he's wonderful. And he's been, you know, very supportive and has helped us. And then we're realizing, okay, well, there still isn't somebody that we know within the statute but we can't just sit on this and wait for someone to just show up right, because how right. are we going to, you know, we reached out to women. Mm-hmm. We reached out to women that we knew he worked with. And some of the women in our group, we found that way. Yeah. Um, and others were just shocked and, oh, well, he's been nothing but professional for me, you know, with me, you know, which was like, oh, we're so happy to hear that. And, right. you know, to be completely honest, there were some women that nothing had happened to them and they were like, I am so sorry. Um, I believe you and I stand by you. And, you know, and then there were other women that were, you know, oh, nothing happened to me. You know, why are you accusing him of this? Like it was very and you're like, you're okay, great that it didn't happen to you. But whether it's one person saying it happened to them or 30 people saying it doesn't matter if it happened to one person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you say, okay. Well, that happened to them. And the best thing they could have said was, you know, I'm I'm sorry that happened to you and I and I believe you. And, you know, what they do outside of that moment, fine. You go back and work with him, that's your choice. Right. You know, right. Right. knowing this. Or you walk away or whatever. But oh, to make that immediate reaction. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It just so frustrating of like, well, I don't understand, you know, why didn't you say something? Or he right. was nothing but great to me, so... You must have done something exactly. to bring it on. And you're like, you are another woman saying this. Yeah. 
you know, and I understand maybe there's something underneath that. Maybe something did happen they don't want to talk about. Or maybe they feel like, well, why didn't it happen to exactly. me? Exactly. I mean, like, it's even like, that, like, messed up backward stuff of, yes. like, when I thought, when, even, like, this little moment of, like, oh, I, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> You're like that is so effed up. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's <laughs> and it's just these. a fleeting thought, but they happen, and people well you know, react. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it. That's a really like that's a that's a weird line to walk. I mean, again, yeah. my experience is completely different than yours, right? But but there was something to my experience of having this very prominent music person. Who uh, to me it was sort of like, oh, he finds me attractive, yeah. you know that mm. in that first kind of thing, and you, we all want so much to be validated, yeah. of course, right? Yep. And so it's that thing of, oh, I, I think I, is this the validation I want, I, you know? And you kind of go, I don't think so, you <laughs> right. know? And it's, it turns into something, I don't know, something it's, crazy. But ooh, it's that's yeah. what's so confusing about it. That's what's yes, so it's not so black confusing. and white. It's not, yeah. It's yeah. Just and that's not. what I think. And we tried to prepare ourselves. You know, we knew. Oh, and to answer your other question, we started reaching out to media outlets. Okay. Because we're like, okay, well, you know what? We we were advised uh, legally, like, don't. When you're ready to go, you go. Kind of just to protect yourselves. Like, even if you, in any situation, if you think you're the only one and you go, you decide, okay, I'm gonna go to the police. It doesn't matter whether you're one or 30, you will be heard, you will be, you know, listened to and believed. Like, don't ever think that just because you think you're the only one, you can't. But to publicly name him in that way, it was fine, we certainly could, but it, it was suggested to us that if we all started publicly naming him and we didn't do it in a big united front for that very first, that it could not be perceived in the way that we wanted to. People may misinterpret it. Maybe people could look at it like, well, why is this happening? Why are they doing this? Versus all of a sudden there's this big thing and saying the police are involved. It's a very different situation. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and not that just putting his name out there as one person would have been a bad thing. At, not at all. And I applaud everybody that did. I yeah. have big, tremendous respect for that. But if all of a sudden we started doing it as a group individually and naming him versus coming out in full force like that, right. it may not have had. Front, exactly. Yes. And that's why I think the article took on so much steam and was picked up because it was, wait a minute, there is all of this that has been going on behind the scenes, if you will, of these women finding each other and realizing they're not alone and giving the strength to each other. And um, that's, you know, that's kind of where... CNN was very interested in yeah. that, thankfully. Yeah. I just want to have a little side note. Yeah. Which is if you go to someone and they don't believe you, mm. go to someone else. Mm -hmm. Somebody will. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Too yeah. many times, um, you know, if that one person shoots you down, like if it, of, of the people that have said these things where, you know, and again, like I said, we tried to prepare ourselves. And even if you do, it still is hard to hear. But if yeah. that first person you say is like, well, that was years ago. Why didn't you say something? Or, well, did you smile at him? Like, OK, um, <laughs> really, you know, and yeah. give you any little bit of doubt. It's so easy to be like, OK, I'm overreacting. This is just my. You're already you so know. filled with doubt about exactly. it. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. so, and so yeah. push past that because they may be projecting onto you what, yeah. you know, who knows what it is. But somebody will believe you and somebody you know, we'll listen to you. And, yeah. and so if somebody's listening to this podcast mm -hmm. and they say that happened to me uh, with this guy, how, how can they find you? Um, well, we put together an email account that we were using to contact women that when we were asking um, and it's voiceover justice club at gmail.com voiceover justice club at gmail.com gmail .com. Um, as just a safe place that is just to us women. Uh, you know, if you just want to talk or you just have questions or you think you might know someone or you're just, you know, whatever it is that you want to reach out. And then nothing more has to happen at that moment than mm -hmm. that. Um, then, you know, there's resources that we can provide, the detective's information, welcome you into the group. Or, you know, a lot of women were like, this happened to me. 
I just needed you to know, and then I need to back away. Or mm -hmm. this happened to me, I'll contact the detective, I'll file a police report, but I can't be involved in this. And that's absolutely fine, yeah. and we respect that. And there's so many women in that group of the 45 mm -hmm. that are fighting alongside with us, and mm -hmm. they're doing it in their own way, but they are there, and they are, yeah. you know, very yeah. much a part of it. So, yeah. Yeah. And we're, I mean, I'm on Facebook. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty open book there. So Becky Poole on Facebook. <laughs> How do you spell <laughs> your last name? P-O-O-L-E. And I, I have also a lot of the contacts after the article because, you know, people were looking us up because CNN didn't, uh, we didn't think to make sure that there was a way for, right. you know, women. Um, and there was one woman that I spoke to that, and I, I felt awful after the fact because I don't think we thought about this, but she read the article and then she kind of got the runaround in trying to get because it happened to her and she couldn't okay. find the right person to get. Eventually she did. And I applaud her for not giving up. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, that goes to, to say that if, if you, you know, hit that wall or you're not getting the answers you need, Keep going, going keep because, going. Yeah. you know, can yeah. you, it is uh, there. Can you give me that email address one more time? <laughs> Listen to you. I think perhaps I'm going to bring you on as a co host. <laughs> <laughs> Voiceover Justice Club at gmail.com. That's it. I remember. Yay. <laughs> That's great. And, and, you know, if anybody's listening, you, you can contact me and I'll, I'll remind you mm. of that. And I, I can also, also, um, I can also get you in touch with one of these fine women. You know, I am a big believer in our worst moments providing us with the opportunity for our for our best mm. moments. And so I am curious for the both of you, the upside, the upside of, um, I guess, well, I'll let you define it. I'll, I'll let you define your upside because it's hard to say, well, the upside of, you know, being sexually assaulted. Like, is there one? But <laughs> it's sort of what comes after mm -hmm. and how you respond to it. So I just would be curious how this has positively affected you. Um, I've actually been thinking about that a lot, to be honest. And I think a lot of that is just my way of dealing with it. Because, you know, when it first, especially when Me Too first came out, it was so hard for me to to get out of that, get out of the, you know, anger and sadness and hurt yeah, yeah. and, you know, betrayal and all that. And so um, I actually, you know, have, have spent a lot of time thinking about that myself. And I think for me, the biggest thing is the, that if it hadn't happened to me, if it hadn't happened to me, then I wouldn't be able to right now help the other women that it did happen to and to stop other women from it happening to them. Yes. Because if it didn't happen to me, it would have been somebody else. And all of the friends over the years that I was able to share this story with, every one of them gave so much love and support and they went on to warn other women, don't work with this guy, never naming me because they're, you know, great friends and they were able to do that. And so I knew that for every person that I told, they were warning more people. Yeah. So I felt that even though it took this long to get to this point, there were still little bits that were happening that if it hadn't happened to me, that person that that person had warned mm -hmm. could have happened to them. Yeah. So similar, <laughs> similar for me too, just that it finally got out. That mm -hmm. it, and other women can be warned. I think, and in more of a general way with, um, with me too, but specifically the situation, I consider myself, I'm, I'm a feminist. I am, <laughs> I fight for social justice. And then yet here I was kind of sitting on my own story for a while and like finding my voice and like, I don't have to feel selfish about embracing my voice. Mm, it doesn't yeah. have to be for someone else in particular, but even then it's like, well, I'm glad because other women are being helped. And so it can be both. Like, yes, it does, yes, you don't, sure. I just, just more loud, more often, what I'm happy to see. Yeah. <laughs> more loud, more often. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Is there anything else that you want to say, explore, shed light on? 
Yeah, man, I, I could talk about this <laughs> subject for you. It just touches everything. It's it, You could relate it to any other part of your life in a really big, scary, exhausting way. <laughs> but, like, I think, well, I think I, we covered it. Well... I feel a little bit like a dork, just in that, like, I'm, again, I, I generally am very, you know, have this capacity to just sort of flow from one thing to the next. And I do sort of feel like, oh, I just want to make sure that everything that needed to be said was said. And and also, I want to be sensitive, right, mm. to the experience of the thing. And at the same time, I don't want to be fearful to talk about it. You right. know what I mean? Exactly. So it's like what a do really... You, yeah. Well, what do you think... What do you think we didn't cover or what do you want to say? Oh, I don't even know. I, I, I think that's it. It's it's a little bit like I have my own experiences of being mistreated and, and have dealt with them in the ways that I have. But but th- this is this is different in in a certain sense in that you guys are sharing an experience with a one particular human that has also to do with your your livelihood, you know, and has happened in this space of time, you know, mm-hmm. when all this other Hollywood crap has, you know, has been revealed. So I don't know. It just feels like this big, gnarly lizard, mm-hmm. you know, that you're kind of trying to <laughs> wrangle, you know. I, and I think it is. And there's no one conversation that's going to Yeah, that's going to cover, cover it all. It. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's very true. I will say I it does, again, the idea of agency and who who gets what of your story. <laughs> Part of me wants to say he has very little to do with my voiceover career. Yeah. Like, and yes. I don't, in, and I, and I'll never know if the reason I did mostly kid voiceover forever is because I was like, oh, I will never do a Victoria's Secret ad because it will remind me of Peter yeah. Ruffin. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll never know if that was actually A to B. Right. It could be. I could, I could say that's an, that's definitely an option. I could also say, like, I like cartoons. Like, it, mm-hmm. <laughs> So well, to and give it, him that power yeah. is like, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> Isn't the big thing about that is that you get to define that. Yeah. Yes. You get to define yes, it. Yes, absolutely. For yourself, for, yep. for sure. I know. Yes. I, I Again, I, I, I feel like part of the reason that I ended up in voiceover was because of the experience I had in music, which translated to the stage, which translated to, you know, and it was sort of like, it all turned into terror for me, being up in front of people on camera stuff. It was like, like that was a nightmare to me, it turned into a nightmare. Mm. And I didn't want to do it. And it was it was just awful. Right. And then I find this class, this voiceover class. And I, I, I do remember having this thought of that seems safe. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And so so you go, oh, wow. You know, and I but I never would have I never would have pieced it together with that experience and so is that why is that you know but but we're all trying we all are trying to sort of piece our history together to make it all make sense right right and uh i heard somebody say that you know oh oh i was watching the history of the eagles last night which i highly recommend (laughs) um and um, Joe Walsh was talking about some philosopher that he was reading saying our lives as they move as they move and tumble forward they just feel so kind of happenstance and this thing happens and that thing happens and but you turn around and you look at your life and it seems like a finely crafted novel yeah. you know mm-hmm. where everything fit where it was mm-hmm. supposed to and led you in this particular direction to the life that you have mm-hmm. and and it's those kinds of things that remind me to be grateful yeah. because i love where i am yeah. and who i am mm-hmm. and i and I am the culmination of all of my experiences, the good ones and the bad ones. And yeah. so it's a matter of, of us all putting experiences like this into perspective, mm-hmm. you know, and, and yeah. so there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being on this show. Um, I think it's, um, thank you. I think it's the, yeah, uh, the, the most important one I've done. And I, mm-hmm. I'm really privileged that you joined me in telling your story. So in terms of your voiceover careers, where can people find you in your work? You'll find me on BeckyPool.net. BeckyPool.net. Um, it, yeah, I play the musical Saw, too, so you'll probably see most of them. Okay, that's first. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you can hire me for both. Um, what they say? So yeah. awesome. <laughs> uh, and buy Pop-Tarts, so they keep uh, wild cherry Pop-Tarts. Buy those. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> 
Um, I'm uh, heathercosta.com. Fantastic. Tell are me. you guys on social media? Do you we care are. about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So. I love Instagram. I love pictures. It's Becky D. Pool or Becky Pool. Okay. Across platforms. Across platforms. Same for you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Heather Costa, VO on okay. uh, different platforms. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. If you share a story similar to those that you've heard today involving Peter Rofe and want resources or someone to talk to, please send an email to voiceoverjusticeclub at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.